Hello, this is Liz from Vault Run Lead. I'm the Director of Communications or Operations and Community at, uh, at Vault Run Lead. Um, I am so excited today to be joined by Courtney Knapp from Denver, who I'm just meeting for the first time right now over this webinar. But I'll tell you, when uh, I talked to Faith Winter, um, who's a state representative out in Colorado, she said, you are one of the best speech coaches she has ever seen. And she just thinks the world of you. And, you know, Faith is top notch in my book, so I'm really excited. Um, that you're going to present for us today. Um, I'm going to just say a little bit about Vote Run Lead uh, because uh, the deck today is really full. And if we get a chance, um, uh, folks on the chat and online, you can ask your questions either in the chat box right down in the lower left hand uh, of, your, of your screen, or Selena is telling me you can also uh, tweet using hashtag VRL Nation uh, to uh, or email info at voterandlead.org with your questions. But at some point, um, if we have some time towards the end of this uh, session or in the middle and it seems appropriate, um, we one or two of you might have the opportunity to pop on your video camera with your webinar uh, capability and do some one-on-one -on -one, um, with Courtney right here and now. So that's pretty exciting to me. We're, you know, just learning some of this technology. And so um, uh, here we go. Uh, we're recording this. So folks will be able to watch this, send it to your friends, um, use it in the future, refer back to it. So, you know, uh, don't worry about taking notes or, or copying down the, the slides or anything like that. Just relax and enjoy. Uh, and uh, if you're new to Vote Run Lead and this may be your first encounter, please explore our website. Um, we're an organization devoted to advancing women leaders like at every level, regardless whether uh, you want to be working in community or working in business, you're going to be running in the future, you're running right now. Um, it's really open to everybody. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and we hook up women um, with great, amazing trainers. We have 30 trainings on deck for this year coming up, and uh, we're just getting started. So uh, I'm going to keep it short uh, because I'm, I, for one, am somebody who really struggles with public speaking, and so I am really excited to hear from you, and I think so many of us, like myself, uh, learned our public speaking through trial and error. So you find yourself saying, okay, I'll do it. You're at the podium, and then you get down and you're not really sure what to do. <laughs> so, anyway, so I'm very excited that you're, you're joining us today. And with that, I'm going to, um, uh, you know, turn it over to you, Courtney. She's got uh, years and years of coaching with businesses, nonprofits, education, and political leaders, um, facilitating workshops and training. You're also involved with Emerge out in Colorado. I think I got that right. Um, and has launched three companies. She's just a huge, valuable resource uh, for us. And now, once you're on this webinar, you're connected with her. And um, hopefully we'll get uh, some stuff started today, and there'll be more in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Liz. It's a pleasure to be amongst the community of women that are building and Thanks. developing their leadership skills. <laughs> um, seeing more women in leadership roles is indeed a passion of mine. I have been working in leadership communication and public speaking as a coach and a trainer for the past nine years. And as Liz mentioned, uh, I'm a part of the Emerge America candidate training program and have had the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with candidates uh, in their messaging development, uh, in their stump speeches, and with regard to their delivery of those speeches. Um, so today, we'd be happy for it to be interactive. Um, you know, we developed this presentation based on what we think is important to consider when you're putting your stump speech together. 
um, but to your specific questions and sharing of your experiences would add a lot of value to this webinar. So please do um, add to the chat and hopefully we can um, respond to some of those questions and as Liz mentioned, maybe take the opportunity to do some individual coaching for folks if they're interested. So to start off, the purpose of a stump speech, um, maybe we think about this, maybe we don't. Um, stump speeches are a necessity on a campaign. The reason that they're valuable is that we get to craft them. We get to think uh, them through and determine what do we want to present to our audiences and get really clear on our messaging. And then because they're often repeated, um, we get to deliver them from, from memory. Uh, so when delivering a presentation, it is not enough to just have a well-written speech. One of the most important things is to connect with the audience in front of you, and that can be done a number of ways, through body language, through eye contact, through a warm smile. Uh, sometimes we go into our professional mode and we forget about smiling and um, connecting with the audience. Um, other ways to connect with the audience is to acknowledge them, to uh, have common reference points that the audience will be aware of. And then, indeed, a well-crafted message that resonates with not only the audience, but with you. Um, and oftentimes, when I'm working with candidates to determine what their issues are that they want to include in their stump speech, we talk about the intersection between what uh, the community cares about and what they're passionate about. And that intersection of those values and issues are the sweet spot for including in your stump speech. Um, and any time that you're speaking about something that you're passionate about, your tone is going to be engaging, your body language is going to be engaging. That will naturally follow when we talk about things that we're passionate about. So make sure that you're considering that as well. Um, as you look over this list, purpose of a stump talked about connecting, allowing the audience to get to know you, and building relationships. All of this comes before uh, how you tell your story, um, the issues that you're going to talk about. Uh, another opportunity for your stump speech is to overcome a perceived weakness. So race-specific issues may be um, that I am new to the area and that that's a weakness that I want to overcome. So I can be proactive to address that in my stump speech. Or maybe I'm young and I'm afraid that um, the, the negative impression might be that I, is around my experience. So how can I be proactive in addressing that and showcasing all of my ideas and my awareness of the issues in my stump speech? So by being proactive, you can overcome a perceived weakness. And then, of course, it allows us to focus on message, our message that we want to talk about and to spotlight and inspire the audiences that we come in contact with. You'll see on this how to, uh, what you can use a stump speech for. Increased relationship is here again. That's how important it is. Sarah McCall in her presentation last week was talking about all politics are relationships, relationship to politics, politics are relationships. Um, can't agree with that enough, even if we aren't on the same side of the aisle. Um, when people respect us and um, they're more likely to tell their friends. They might even come across the aisle and vote for us. So those relationships are important, as well as building your recognition, your visibility, and your credibility. And then we're going to talk a lot today about leadership qualities. Um, and this is really the starting point. So when I'm working with a candidate, before we ever put ideas to paper, our first questions are, what is your brand? And that term brand uh, means what do people think of when they think of you? What associations do they make? Maybe you have a background in the environmental uh, movement, so they think of you as an enviro. That could be, that could be a positive or a negative for your campaign. Um, if you are a teacher or coming from education, that might be something that they already associate with you. Um, and then this can expand beyond what you've done and your experience to your leadership qualities, um, your personality, you know, are you a coalition builder, do you listen well, um, are you a hard worker, all of these things that um, 
people's initial impressions of us, or maybe they've worked with us in the past, go into what our brand is. So this can be by default, or we can take control of it and be really focused on what associations do we want people to make with our name recognition and our brand. We started to mention leadership qualities. Um, this is something that we want to spotlight in our in our stump speech. The stump speech um, will talk, it will touch on issues, but it doesn't get into the into the details of our issues and platform. It's really about your leadership qualities and your values and spotlighting what those are. So, for example. Um, Leaders that you might know, let's talk about coalition builders. They are collaborative in their leadership. They um, can work across partisan lines. That might be a leadership quality. They're hard workers. They're persistent. They stay the course until they see it through. Um, those are all leadership qualities that, that back up our brand. So for candidates, um, that are putting together their stump speech to start here. What are your strengths and your unique ability, uh, your values, and your experience that you want that you um, want the voters, the community to know and associate with you? So again, all of this is what's behind your brand. This is uh, people make impressions of us very quickly. What are those associations that they're making, and how can you take charge of it? So if I think that somebody is going to see or um, see me as a young, maybe inexperienced candidate, I am going to be sure I include in my stump speech lots of ideas and solutions and awareness of uh, what's going on in the community to um, counterpoint. And then desired outcomes. So again, before you've written a word for your stump speech to consider what brand do you want to convey and what are the outcomes that you want the audience to leave with. So this might be those, those leadership styles that we talked about. This might be um, she's going to fight for education. She's going to fight for economic development in our community. Um, she is going to be a coalition builder on the council. Um, she is going to listen to teachers when she's sitting on the board of education. You know, which, and, and I would say it's more like five goals for your stump speech, um, but if you start with three, you'll probably overflow into five goals. What do you want when folks walk out of that conversation? What do you want them to leave with and take away? Um, and, I'll, and I'll share an example of a candidate that I was working with who had decided to, uh, to challenge in the primary race um, the, part, the established party's um, sort of next in line candidate. So she ruffled a few feathers by getting into the race. And um, this person had a ton of experience. They um, are, were a campaign organizer, a community organizer, and were well qualified for the position. So there's some speech had all of that expertise and experience covered. Um, but knowing that the position was that she was upsetting the, the establishment and the party, we needed to make sure that she came in and built relationships. Um, and sometimes when we go into delivering a, a well-scripted speech, something that we've gone over and over and it's high stakes and it's really important, we sort of adopt this professional veneer and we put on our professional mask where um, people don't get to know our personality and we're hiding behind what we have prepared. I see Liz has I a, popped up. I have a, I popped up. <laughs> I have a question for you. Oh, I'm going to make sure I'm not on mute. No, I'm not. Great. <laughs> um, I'm going to just go back to leadership qualities for a second, and I'm wondering if you can give, like, a couple examples of um, – you, so you're saying with the leadership qualities, so you should write these down, right? So, and these are things you admire in other people, and then sort of how you um, embody those same things when you're out in the world doing 
you're saying? Is that? These are really your personal leadership strengths, and there are a number of exercises that you could um, could could apply to to uncover them. Um, one is you can write down your own strengths. What do you think they are? And these could be uh, creative solutions. Um, this could be um, being really empathetic and having an understanding for folks that are um, maybe outside of your situation, um, as well as being a hard worker, being smart and experienced. So you might be able to develop that list yourself. When I work uh, with my coaching clients, I will often have them ask their peers, their coworkers, their friends, and loved ones to give them feedback on what they see as their, as their list of strengths and unique abilities. Right? What is something that I roll out of bed in the morning and I do right when I wake up without even thinking about it? Oftentimes we undervalue these attributes and forget to spotlight them and highlight them because they come so naturally to us. So by bringing it to your awareness, either through polling your friends um, or by you know, reflecting on what they could be yourself um, to, to be aware of what your unique strengths are. And so strengths, would you say, you know, um, what are some sort of surprise, or I think sometimes when I, you get into the strengths piece and it's like, um, you know, if you're a risk taker, well, that can be a strength, even though it doesn't seem like it. Or, you know, I'm like, are there, um, and then, well, I'm just, I'm going to, I'm really into this, so let me just let you take it from here and, uh, I'm sure this is all going to roll together. So We could do a full uh, webinar probably on, on strengths and how to apply them. And um, you know, sometimes our greatest strengths can also be a, a weakness, right? I tend to be very detail-oriented. Right. That's a strength or a challenge. Um, but in, in this scenario, to really know what you bring to your leadership um, right. and so that you can own it. This is really about being aware of what your brand is, what your leadership qualities are, what your experience and expertise is, um, so that you can own it and then share that out with an audience in your stump speech and in your engagement. Okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> sure. And please, uh, if there are any other questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand. So desired outcomes might be um, based on what a perceived weakness is. So again, with that example of being an inexperienced or a young candidate, um, my desired outcome is that one of their takeaways is that I really know the issues and I've got ideas for solutions. Um, it might be that they like me. You know, with that candidate that I was talking about that was going into a rough primary, had kind of ruffled some feathers um, with the established party, that likability piece is really important. And so that starts when you walk in the room, not just when you take the stage to deliver your speech. So really anchoring on what your desired outcomes are. Um, if, I'm a, if I'm a little known candidate, I, my, one of my outcomes and goals is to develop my, the recognition, my name recognition, who I am, what's my background, as well as developing my credibility so that people walk out of there knowing what my experience is and that I can do the job. So being really clear with those desired outcomes, then we move into actually developing and writing the, the speech. So questions that a good stump speech should answer. This um, is not my original list. This, I've, I've edited it, but um, the list has been around for a while. As far as what's your story, why are you running, what is the problem, and why are you the solution, um, you'll see that things have changed. And over the last few years, we've, we want to spend less time on the problem. Audiences are really tired of the blame pointing that, you know, we all feel overwhelmed by how many things we have to solve in this world. Um, so we want to identify that there's a problem, but spend more time focusing on our vision for the solution, our ideas for the solution, than, uh, than pointing fingers so that it's more aspirational and that our talk is inspirational to the audience. So again, um, 
six questions to consider when you're putting your stump speech together. So we should answer what is your story so the audience knows about your background, your values, your experience. And then this why you're running is the second question. Um, but when I'm helping construct the speech, I often suggest that you, you answer that question right up front, and we'll talk more about that. Identifying the problem that you're there to solve, and then what is your vision and solution, and how are you going to be that solution. Uh, and then number six is what can they do. So you've got a room full of people that you've just inspired and motivated and engaged in your campaign. Now give them something to do, whether it's write a check, whether it's sign up for my mailing list, uh, volunteer to help knock doors, um, you've got them on the hook, so to tie in a tangible act um, is, is really valuable to include that as well. So we'll break these down, take a look at them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, what is your story? And one way to approach this is to write out your story, uh, the long version, so that you've got you know, where have you been? What experiences have you gone through? What successes have you had? What have you achieved? And you're looking at it all at once. And then when we decide which parts of your story to spotlight in the stump speech, we want to make sure that it's aligned with those desired outcomes and the brand that you're looking to achieve. So again, how and where does your story align with the brand? and how does it support your desired outcome. Um, so candidates that, that I'll work with one-on-one -on -one will bring me their resume, their bio, and maybe a written essay on what they think their story is. So I've got everything in the mix, and then we'll start narrowing it down and pulling out um, the, the points, the critical pieces that back up their brand and, and the outcome. One of the most important things is owning your story. And um, for many of us, there are parts of our story that we're not sure whether it's appropriate for a stump speech. And if it is something that um, went into shaping you, <clears throat> I would encourage you to own it. So I've worked with candidates that um, had rough starts. They were in a um, household that was possibly not safe, dealt with homelessness growing up, um, you know, parents that may have had challenges or addictions with alcohol and drugs and thought, I will never share that piece of me on the campaign trail. And through practice and uh, figuring out how to own that piece of their story, it becomes a really relevant piece of their campaign. That background um, not only shows that they can rise above challenges and adversity, um, but also lets us know that they're going to have a perspective on how public education is important. So, you know, they're often tying those pieces of their story into um, what they're advocating for and working towards. So our, our stories are, are really important. Um, but you do get to choose what you spotlight. So um, maybe you're in a career that isn't that sexy or glamorous, and um, dare I reference any specific career here <laughs> and insult anybody. Um, but maybe it's the things that you do in your free time and your volunteer time that you want to spotlight, that you are a coalition builder in in your community and working towards safe streets in your community or um, as a youth mentor and so you understand how important education and economic development is. So you get to choose which parts of your story you want to spotlight. And then the framing is something to consider as well. Um, so I have worked with uh, candidates that are from outside of the country and have moved here to the United States and have not been sure on, on how to frame that. And um, by and, and there's a way, again, to own that piece of your story. Um, there is a woman that I've been working with recently who is from uh, Venezuela, and or she grew up in Venezuela, and she, when she was initially talking about running for office, she was getting the feedback of kind of 
downplay that side of her story and that side of her personality and brand. And she's got an accent and um, has a lot of energy, and, and that is part of who she is. And so I will say that, you know, that's a challenge when someone says it's not okay for you to, to be who you are and, and get elected to office. And I would overturn that and turn it on its head. And it's how you own it, and it's how do you frame it. And so on her, um, in her stump speech, she talks about um, growing up. Oh, um, she spent her childhood in Venezuela instead of growing up there. And there was some research done on that sort of language that it holds more favorably to say that you spent your childhood there versus when you talk about growing up there, um, it's a little bit different and, and it's just a, a slight word change. So how you frame things can help with the impact of your story. Um, and then she goes on in her stump speech to talk about um, how passionate she is about democracy and that it is because of her um, you know, spending her childhood in a country that didn't have this sort of democracy, that she values it and is so passionate about it. Um, she refers to the American dream in her stump speech. As a small business owner, she and her husband were able to start their business and, and strive for that American dream of, of um, improving your situation. So whatever your story is, own it, know that you can frame it, that ties to the values that you and your community cares about. And then again, just beating this drum that um, we want to tie our story to the desired outcomes and the goals for your pitch. And so this woman that I'm talking about, this, this candidate uh, from Venezuela, um, she wants to be a voice for her entire community. So um, that is a piece that, that she includes in her stump speech um, that is relevant to her goals. And then the why are you running? Uh, attached at the end, there's a reference at the end of this presentation, and I will refer you to a TED talk by a gentleman named Simon Sinek, who talks about the power of talking, speaking to why we are doing something. We often talk about what we're doing, how we're doing it, um, but audiences really resonate and get inspired around the why. Um, so there is a um, woman here in Colorado that uh, spotlights why she is running for the Board of Regents, University Board of Regents. She talks about, I am committed to seeing every Colorado child has access to an affordable college education in this state. And then parts of her story talk about how important education was to her having the opportunity to achieve what she's achieved. Um, to education being important to her as a single mom as well. Um, so all of those things are in line. Dive into why you're running, and we want to address that right up front. Again, valuable to think about the intersection between the things that you're passionate about, your experience, and what the voters care about, as well as that intersection of your values and what the community's values are. And we want to build this into those responses of why you're running. Liz, I can't hear you. I can see you. Do you have some examples of? Um, why you're running, just some why you're running examples. I, I feel like this is the thing that gets missed when I watch candidates at the stump. Uh, you know, they can tell, um, just the, they, connecting that dot for like, okay, who you are, but why are you doing this? And I feel like a lot of people really, that's what they're wondering when they're listening, when they hear you. Like, why are you doing this? You know, what is your, you know? Do you remember that moment when um, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were in the Democratic primary race for president, and Hillary mm -hmm. gets caught 
on video uh, and it gets shared around YouTube. And the question that she's asked is, why are you doing this? I mean, she was just getting beat up. She was getting you know, personally attacked. And she peers up and responds with, I just love America so much. Um, and I often cite this example because before that was caught on YouTube, she, her numbers were um, on, in the decline. And that got spread virally. Um, you know, I understand that her campaign was concerned because, um, you know, she was showing, showing a moment of weakness by peering up. Um, the, the community responded favorably. She actually won the New Hampshire primary right after that video was released. And people could see why she was running, and it felt authentic. So this authenticity piece is critical. Um, and I come back to this slide with all of the questions because there are a lot of ways to show why you're running. Um, sometimes it is uh, in response to the problem. So one of the candidates that I've worked with started her speech off with, uh, I'm, I'm running for this seat because this district deserves a strong progressive voice, and, and I will be that voice for you at the State House. Um, with that, she's referring to the fact that their current incumbent was not a strong progressive voice at the State House. And this could be, I'm running to be a strong conservative voice, and, and, this, deserve, and this district deserves this. Um, so that's one example. Um, another in a city council race um, was a woman, and this is part of her story, is that she used to drive from the south side of town to where she worked uh, on the north side of town every day along this one street. So she crossed Denver. And she would talk about seeing um, in her neighborhood all the dollar stores, the vacant Target, Target that had, had left and had been sitting vacant for a couple of years. And as she drove further north, she saw more Starbucks, more retail outlets, dry cleaners, grocery stores. Um, and so that the development, she, she um, talked about why she is running to um, be a voice for bringing more development to her community, positive development, smart growth development to her community. Um, and that was tied into why she is running and to her story based on her personal experience. Great. Great. So all of these I do, there's one, one, one other thing I just want to chime in with is um, when you were talking about um, sort of spotlighting your expertise, and I, I was thinking about a woman who ran for statewide office, um, and uh, it was said of her, she was just a great candidate, and she worked at a department store. And they were like, how can you hold this statewide office? And this is, you know, your experience. And... Um, you know, it was sort of like, you know, a shock the world kind of thing. It was like, no, she said, no, yeah, that's what I do. And so this is what it makes me good at. And it really, really worked for her, and she won. And, um, you know, everybody, um, you know, like all the, the insiders and whatever. And so I just always try to encourage people to, like, you know, own what you're expert at, and it all counts. You know, every single thing counts. So yes, yes. anyway, I just was thinking that while you're talking. I'll, I'll let you continue. Thank you. And, and please continue to jump in. I think that adds value. It's lonely okay. here being the only one talking. Um, <laughs> there was a woman that I worked with who uh, was running for county clerk. And she was, and what inspired her to run, she, she'd been an engaged constituent. She, you know, went to city hall meetings and, and you know, sat in the audience and, and paid attention to what was happening in town. And when she was working in the county clerk office, uh, she was a janitor there. And she saw these ballots just being left around the office and the they, um, lack of, you know, responsibility and um, conscientiously doing the job. And so she successfully ran for that seat um, as as the janitor in the in the county um, offices, um, but was able to talk about what she was going to do and her ideas and how to improve the office in a way that added to her credibility and built her credibility. I have one, I have one more question for you. Do, um, so in these stump speeches, when you get to the uh, when you're 
you had said a little bit earlier, you know, you ask people what you want them to do. Can you, I know, um, you know, sometimes you you wonder why you just ask a room full of people for money and they don't give you money. Or you ask them to come and volunteer and they didn't volunteer. And um, what I've learned from asking other people is that, well, you didn't actually land that in a strong way. And just could you talk a little bit about the importance and some tips of like how to really, you know, land land your stump speech? Be, be direct. <laughs> um, you know, don't include too many maybes or if you wouldn't mind contributing today, right? It's just with your contribution today, your contribution today will send me to the state house to represent you, to be your voice. Um, so to not make the ask like folks are doing you a favor. When we are running for public office, we're actually doing our communities a favor. And to phrase our language um, in that way, with your support, I will go and advocate for you on these issues. Um, your support of this much today will help send me to the seat, and I'll be your voice. So it is positioning it and framing it in, in the audience's best interest. Um, and we're going to take a look at, at Faith Winter's stump speech from her most recent campaign or her kickoff speech from her most recent campaign. Um, and you'll see an example of she has a really collaborative and uh, I would say that her brand is um, She's, she's collaborative, she's a coalition builder, and you can see that language in her stump speech. So at the end in the ask, she talks about, I can't do this alone. You know, here's the rest of my team, and we need you also. So it's engaging and enlisting um, folks with that ask. Hi, we have a question from the chat box that I'm going to relay right now that says, Barbara Lee's studies show that it's harder for women to overcome perceived negatives. Women also tend to have to prove their qualifications in ways that men don't. Please address those issues at some point. Um, so I'll let you uh, just know that's in the chat and incorporate or address it right now. Yes, yeah, we can talk about it right now. Um, this this is something that we had perceived was was the case, and then there's actual data and studies now that that back up our experience that women um, are seen differently for the same behaviors. So um, assertive behavior by women can be seen as aggressive and um, unwelcome and unpleasant. So I um, work with people to you know we're part of changing that paradigm, and it's. Maybe our communities aren't used to it, but we need to get them used to that, seeing women in leadership roles, seeing women as directors, and telling other people what to do. So that's a part of it. And then the other piece is part of our strengths as women is this uh, social intelligence that we have and being able to be aware of others and know when to be assertive and directive and know when to ask questions and bring others along. Um, so this comes into personal choice on how you want to play this. But I think that women have the strength and the uh, grace to be able to navigate both that. So knowing that women can be seen as the B-I-T-C-H word, or we can be called that. Is that allowed on <laughs> run leave? Ah. <laughs> So we can we can get those labels, and then this is part of owning your brand. How are you going to be both an assertive, strong leader, and also build relationships, um, which which is important. Yeah. So I would I would add I would add to that. You know that women have to prove um, themselves. I want I just want to say it's not your imagination. I remember Celinda Lake talking once about how they had done. Um, uh, television ads uh, with a, a male governor candidate and a female governor candidate. I can't remember the uh, exact example that they used, but they were both actors. They both said the same thing. 
And immediately when the woman uh, uh, appeared on the screen, the dial went down. You know, the do you like this person? It goes up. Do you not like this person? It goes down. You know, and they were measuring that. And so I just like to say, you know, it's we do have to kind of prove ourselves um, in in a way. And so we have to find quick ways to, like, uh, sort of get the elephant in the room out, you know, and be like, yes, I'm, you know, I'm a credible, I'm a credible, I'm qualified, quick ways to kind of do that. But I do like to just tell people, like, it's not your imagination, you know. <laughs> it's, it's something that really goes on. And so it can be awkward um, and definitely um, the, all the research shows that men do not have to prove themselves. They're just given automatic authority, um, much more than we are still. You know, it's changing, I think, but still it's definitely an issue. So something to be aware of so that you know, um, I think like if you're young too, that's another issue. There is a great candidate here in Minnesota, Kate Knuth, who is running for the state legislature, and she was perceived as very young, and she just right off the bat said, a lot of people are saying I'm too young for this. And, you know, she you know, compared herself to, you know, said, you know, Hubert Humphrey was this old when he did this, and uh, Kennedy was this old when he did that, and Martin Luther King was this old when he did this. And so she just really right. knocked it out of the park. So. Anyway, be be proactive. Uh, we need to be able to talk about our experience here. Um, that I think is really uh, that I want to. Uh, it says, "What if you think you're too old to start in politics, but you're passionate?" Bring that passion. We need perspectives across the board. Um, so you're never too old. You're never too young. Get involved. Jump in and craft. Craft your brand, craft your stump speech, craft your messaging um, so that it's positive. You know, the voice in our head has all of the uh, doubt and, um, you know, is very aware of all our challenges and weaknesses. When we put it out to the world, we're going to bring our best self out there. So, that's great. You've got more experience to spotlight. Um, you're never too old. Jump in. Okay. Did that did that answer that? Yep. Uh, and, I and think I would so. Feel free to chat if you want to know more. <laughs> it's my understanding that women get elected when we run. We get elected just as. Courtney, I can't hear you anymore. The sound is gone. Nope, still nothing. Rats. That's okay, guys. We have uh, another option. She can go ahead and dial in. Just give us a few seconds, and we'll get back up and going. Thanks, Lena. You're welcome. I still can't, yes, I can hear you now. You sound great. Hey, you, you can hear me. Oh, good. Okay. okay. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you for the notice. Uh, I'm not sure where my sound dropped off, but what I was speaking to was that, let me mute my, excuse me, okay, that women tend to win 
as often, when we run for office, we win as often as men do. So yes, there is some data out there that when we display leadership qualities, same as men do, we are negatively perceived. When we're running for office, we get elected just as often. Um, and then we're actually more effective legislators is, is the data. Uh, and I think that's because we realize that this is a collaborative role and women are often seen as more collaborative, um, less self-centered, and, and that's what people want to see in representing us. So don't let any of that stop you. Okay, so I think if we can jump to um, the example of the stump speech that you've got that uh, there's a link to Faith Winter's stump speech. And if y'all want to pull that up. Uh, I think we talked about what is your values, what's your vision. And then to reiterate, why are you the solution to solve those challenges or problems? So as you pull up, hopefully you can see uh, Representative Faith Winter's stump speech. This is a long version. So when you put your stump speech together, you'll want to have a long version for your kickoff, um, and then also have versions of your stump speech that are shorter, right? One minute introductions, three minute introductions, five minute introductions that meet those desired outcomes that you're looking for. Um, but going over this document together, it's a great example of how she starts with the why right up front. I'm so excited for you all to be here tonight to come together to work for a better future for Colorado. So part of Faith's brand is that she's a coalition builder, she's collaborative, she gets teams together to solve problems, uh, and her why is right up front. It's to make, create a better future in Colorado. And then, even as she starts her speech acknowledging her family, and through this, it spotlights what her brand is, what her values are. Family is important to her. Um, she spotlights her sister's work at a homeless shelter. Um, she talks about being an advocate for the homeless later. So this is one of the issues that's going to be a common theme throughout her talk. Um, and then she, and then also spotlighted in this introduction uh, are her values of, you know, respecting her dad and how he helped teach her to make the world a better place. Um, there's this common thing, making lives better. You scroll down a little further, she starts to get into specific issues. Um, about what she will will fight for when she's serving Colorado. See that every family has access to safe and affordable housing. And then she addresses the why. So there are children who are on their way home from school, are more worried about where they will sleep than their homework. These children are not being set up for success. So it's really clear why homelessness is an, is an issue um, for making Colorado a better place. So again, it's consistent with her themes, and it's really impactful to talk about the why. And again, we've got her spotlighting her brand. We need to work together, think creatively. Part of her brand is coming up with creative solutions. Um, she repeatedly talks about families, so that this is clearly one of her values. And then we talked about establishing credibility. And she does this through using examples of things that she did when she was serving as, on city council. Um, so I'll let you all read that and won't read it to you. Um, but she gives examples of connecting families to services um, that spotlights her leadership strengths of coming up with creative solutions, her brand of working hard for working families. 
Uh, and then in the next paragraph, she talks about a couple of other issues, uh, the environment and the economy. And again, you'll see her use phrases like work hard, roll up my sleeves and work. So there's a consistency in her brand and values of hard work. Any questions or comments so far? Um, Liz, if you can help out if there's anything in the chat, feel free to pop, pop in. And again, she uses another example here of sitting on city council, putting solar panels on the city buildings um, to reduce our energy consumption. The thing that um, stands out to me about this particular example, and I wish uh, we had the technology to see a couple of speeches, you know, and then it becomes much more live, of course. This is uh, the webinar. It's a little, it's hard to be, have it come alive. And um, But I like the vi uh, the visual images, and I know it's one of my favorite women uh, speakers, um, and men speakers, you know, they paint images um, in my mind, you know, visual images and juxtapositions that are really um, just stick because those are the things that I'll keep thinking about as I'm driving around the road or down the road. And um, uh, I know there's, you know, a story, for example, I know that Faith tells where she's working at a shelter and um, has to drop off one of her uh, the women she's working with um, to, at a depart at a at a big box store because she's going to go in there and sleep, you know, for the night. And she was like, it was like this moment where she was said, "No, you know, I gotta I gotta go upstream and and I want to do something bigger about this." And um, and so those and those like those little stories and as you watch um, CNN or watch the news or during the campaign season, you know, think about those images and kind of break them down and think about like colors, you know, what was the people, t you know, when they talk about the weather, when they talk about anything else, those things like really will just stick with you um, um, in because we're, we're just we're just wired that way, right? I'm not a you know a scientist, yeah. but we do remember those visual images. So I think that's really um, it's, it's great. Yes. So this is this is sharing our stories and experiences with detail, so that the audience can uh, be there with you in their imagination. Um, like you were when Faith was recounting dropping this woman off at work and that her child was going to have to hide in the dressing room all day because they didn't have any place for child care. That's a, a story and an experience that sticks with us. And then we're going to remember why it's important that our community has these services. Um, so those stories have a, have a great impact. Um, I remember a woman that was talking about Meeting, as a college student, having the opportunity to meet Nelson Mandela and tour him around campus and how excited she was. And then she tied that experience to her advocacy for um, breaking up and working on the school-to-prison pipeline that is such an issue for you know, so many incarcerated men. Um, and so she was bringing this issue and tying it to her experience of meeting Nelson Mandela, and we know that he was in my opinion, he was unfairly incarcerated, um, so it ties that metaphor to what she's advocating for. Um, and those things thing, hold weight. So, and something else I also, I also like to play with when I'm practicing to do what any public speaking really is, um, go off the deep end with it while you're practicing. <laughs> And have somebody listen to you and be and ask them, well, what stands out, and where did I start to where did you start to lose me, or you know, you don't want anybody telling you what you should or shouldn't say, but I think there's something really valuable, especially like when you're um, listing your credentials, like you know, while you're practicing, be like, you know, I am, you know, 
the expert on, you know, just take it all the way up to 10. And then um, yeah. just see see what comes out, you know, and um, and then dial it back. And, and then, you know, tr- I think that's where you can kind of conjure up some of those, uh, also some of those visual aids and, and feelings. Um, so, Agreed. Uh, okay. Great. Agreed. So practice with your delivery. Um, have an audience give you feedback. Oftentimes the amazing... Um, I call them tweetable phrases. It's a sentence or two that has a lot of weight and resonance come out of our mouth unexpectedly. And so when we have an audience that we're practicing with that can capture it and say, say it exactly like you just said it, that really works, put that down and include it in your speech. Um, Sometimes there will be phrases that come out that our audience will say, you really shouldn't use that. Um, A woman was talking about getting tickets to the inaugural ball when – Barack Obama was elected, and she referenced um, a connection with the Russian mafia. (laughs) And so from the feedback from the room, I said, boy, I got completely distracted once you you mentioned Russian mafia. So um, use your audiences for for feedback on what works and what doesn't. So we just have a few minutes left, and so I want to... I'm, I'm hoping we can sort of uh, jump through the, the last few of your slides and, um, you know, give, uh, let people and give, know. And give you a minute things. to wrap up. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So the last couple of slides are on delivery. We've talked about connecting with the room, and this is one of the most essential pieces. You've, you've created a great stump speech. You've memorized it. Now, how are you going to deliver it in an authentic way? And I suggest that we know where, how we're going to open uh, open in a way that gets you comfortable with the room uh, and and into your strength as quickly as possible. So for me, that's movement. That's I'm usually walking as I say hello and, and greet the room. And then also knowing where you're going to close, knowing what you're going to what you want to end with. Uh, we can get off track, but being really clear on what your closing is um, will help you. Fix the landing for the gymnastics metaphor. Be natural. Apply your style and strength, not somebody else's. We've all got different styles. Some of us are fast talkers. Some are slow talkers. Some are really sincere. Some are really energetic. Own your own style. Um, And then we want that delivery to be aligned with our desired outcomes as well. So that if I want to make sure the room sees me as likable and warm, I'm going to want my delivery, my body language to match that. And then just a note on continual improvement. When you are on the stump, you have lots of opportunities to deliver the speech. So practice, deliver it with an eye towards always improving. When you're done with a speech, first thing you do is sit down and say, okay, what worked? What do I want to make sure I do again? Um, You can ask people, what really worked in my speech? What should I make sure to do again? And then not leaving yourself open for too much uh, of that critical feedback. I suggest that people really manage who they get that feedback from and ask for it when you're in a place where you can receive it positively. If you're really down on yourself, everything you want to hear is positive. Um, When you're ready, ask for what's the one thing I could do to be more effective and get that feedback. It's ongoing improvement. We don't just get one shot. And I love seeing the Nelson Mandela quote in the chat. Um, So a couple last things to consider is to be really audience-centric before you put your presentation together for this particular audience. Who are they? What's their perspective? Uh, You might frame your stump speech slightly differently based on whether it's being delivered to the PTA or whether it's being delivered to the Chamber of Commerce. If you're not changing it, you've still got your same values, your same leadership strengths the issues that you're passionate about, but you can use different examples and spotlight the benefit to that particular audience that you're speaking to. Uh, And then as Liz said, it's our stories that are really memorable and relatable. So see how you can work in some detailed storytelling. Any questions? 
So I'll hand it back over to Liz. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. And I do, when I went through this deck just quickly before the, the session, um, I thought it was just, you know, and this will be something we'll pass around to everybody. The worksheet and the some speech document we'll send out to everybody who is on the call because um, sometimes it's hard to upload those things while you've got a webinar going on um, based on your, you know, capabilities. These two TED Talks are awesome. Um, I particularly love the one, uh, Amy Cuddy's TED Talk about power posing and just how it can really help you, uh, you know, get ready to, you know, slay the room <laughs> when you're when you're asking for a raise or making a stump speech, whatever it is. So those are, I can't recommend them enough. Um, we'll send those links around to everybody in the follow-up email as well. And then the other thing I want to say about uh, public speaking and stump speeches is take opportunities to um, go to trainings where, you know, in person, where, where, where and when you can. Um, Toastmasters is another great resource. I've, all, I've always been meaning to connect with them in my town, um, but I've heard over and over from uh, women that that's a, a really, well, it's a very widespread and valuable community resource. Um, and uh, we have Go Lead coming up in May in St. Louis, Missouri on May 8th and 9th, and we will certainly have uh, communications uh, training opportunities there. Um, so contact Luli Mola, who's the VRL community organizer for National Go Lead, and um, get yourself to St. Louis and uh, give us a call if you. We have scholarships, and yes, people are agreeing in the chat that Toastmasters is great. Um, and just keep it going. I mean, this is something I see as, um, you know, uh, something just the beginning. And I think also feel free to reach back out to either one of us, I'm sure, um, for any other assistance. Um, the other thing is that uh, with National Go Lead, we're offering a scholarship. And Selena, can you chime in quickly? What is the, uh, what is the scholarship? If you recommend three people who, uh, or maybe just type it in the chat and we'll include it in um, the email that goes out. But Selena, are you are you there? Yes. Um, if you invite three people who are registered for National Go Lead, then we will give you one hundred dollars off the registration, which means it will only be forty nine dollars for you, which is insanely cheap for a two day intensive training. If you invite five people to come with you and they sign up and come, then you also get a free room at the hotel. So on top of the scholarships, we have all kinds of different opportunities so that you can get your friends out there to get in on the leading, which is so important. Great. Thanks, Selena. And um, please wait uh, for the meeting window to close, and um, there's a satisfaction survey. And we're always trying to make these better. Oh, go ahead. I see a question in the chat that I'm, chat that I'm not clear on. It says, Courtney, was it mentioned as part of the stump speech? Um, Kimberly or Kimberlyn, can you add any context to that question? I know we're out of time, but oh, I see. didn't want to miss it. Millennials are in the audience. They're looking at the well, front et cetera. So as part of your stump speech, Pointing people to your social media presence, sure, absolutely. Part of your ask, enrolling them, engaging them in the campaign, better than an email mailing list, right? We're just as good. Well, Does that answer again, your question? Courtney. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And um, we'll have more webinars. Please. Uh, join in next week and then we have Plate to Politics happening next week on Wednesday instead of Thursday and uh, thanks everybody. <laughs>